We're also joined on stage by the general partner of Real Ventures, Janet Bannister. Welcome, Janet. And finally, to lead the conversation, we have Recode's Teddy Schleifer. Thanks, Teddy. Welcome, Teddy. Hey, guys. How are you? So there's, there's some basic disagreement in the world about what even it, this topic we're discussing even is, right? Um, fintech is, a, I feel like, a term that's been tossed around in sort of a meaningless way. You know, we're discussing backstage, like some people have this idea that Uber is a fintech company or, you know, any company that handles money is a fintech company. Right. Do you guys have any, like, basic definitions of even, like, what this topic even is? What even is fintech? I mean, I, I, I don't have, uh, like, a specific view. I, I think what you are starting to see, though, is that more and more financial institutions are becoming tech companies. And I think that's a trend that you're going to continue to see for uh, the foreseeable future. And I think it's in some ways a byproduct of the financial crisis. So I think there's been a shift in your traditional financial institutions with the recognition that they have to invest more in technology. But I think a lot of them are also stuck with uh, a situation where they have legacy technology, legacy people, including in management, that don't really understand technology. And if you look at the leadership of a lot of these large financial institutions, they're disproportionately older, so they haven't had the experience as a consumer coming up in uh, the technology that we now take for granted. Yeah, well, yeah. and I, I would say just building on that, um, I would define a fintech company as a company that is, is either working with or competing against um, either a bank or an insurance company or another large tradition was cons traditionally considered financial services company. And um, I often separate them into those two, sort of either a challenger, which is actually competing directly against the financial yeah. institution, creating their own brand, creating their own business. And then what I would consider enablers, which are working with right. the traditional financial uh, companies, providing services to them to enable them to be more competitive. And so I think both of those, both the sort of the challengers and enablers are part of this fintech system. Well, and, and Jen, don't you think, like, the one thing that I've seen that I think is interesting is the way people who come from a tech background think about finance, they almost think of fintech as independent of traditional finance. And I think that was fine when you were looking at things like payments and some of the early stage uh, technologies. But now, to me, how do you separate the two, right? Like, the reality is, is that technology and the way we use it can't be independent upon bigger trends that are happening in capital markets. And I think a lot of the tech sort of the investors and people in that space think of what they do as independent of these bigger trends that are happening in capital markets and things like that. And I'm a markets person, so to me, I'm anchored there, and then I think about technology versus the reverse. Yeah, I mean, I think to, to some extent, I think, well, geez, every, everything is integrated. integrated. Right. Um, I guess I come at it more from a consumer business perspective, and I think about, you know, really what we're seeing is actually the unbundling of a traditional right. bank, right? And we're seeing this, a traditional bank has, you know, under one roof had all right. these different service, service lines. And what financial service, or what a lot of FinTech companies are doing is they're saying, hey, we don't need to offer all these services. You know, when everything's online, you're no longer going to the bank where, you know, you want to get all the services in one place. And so we have best of breed lenders, best right. of breed, um, you know, wealth management companies, et cetera. And those companies that can go after a specific vertical and offer the absolute best value proposition for their target customer in that vertical, I think, are winning out over the established players who try to offer everything and be everything to everybody. Right. The unbundling of the supermarket model. Yeah, yeah. exactly. So let's talk about it from, from, each, from each side, both the incumbent and the challenger. If you're an incumbent in the fintech space, whether you're you know, Goldman Sachs or your Visa, or your Wells Fargo, you know, or your wealth manager. I feel like there's a, I mean, if, if the goal of a startup is to find a space where there's a big, you know, incumbent that nobody likes, I mean, I don't think people like Wells Fargo. They don't like, you know, going and dealing with uh, the banks or, right. you know, the, the incumbents. They have trouble, and I think a lot of the better minds in fintech understand that. If you were, you know, running one of these incumbents these days, is, is the solution just to, like, 
you know, do balance sheet investing? Is it to buy these companies early? Is it to try and, you know, go to war and beat them? I know you guys are not executives at, you know, Wells yeah. Fargo in this example, but what are you going to do given the fact that there's high customer dissatisfaction with the incumbents and, you know, but they still have this brand, right? Yeah. Goldman Sachs is not displaced overnight. Right. Yeah. I mean, look, I, I think the uh, fitting in that, uh, the thing that I've been struck by, you know, we're, we're an investment business. We invest in real estate and we use technology to do it more efficiently. And, you know, we have relationships with VCs that want to fund our operating company. The one thing I've been struck by in my time spending with the tech community and with VCs is the lack of understanding of capital markets. And to me, that's the real opportunity because you think about capital markets as we know it, global capital markets, they're only 30 years old, right? And the, the reality is, is that that's the opportunity for these tech, fintech companies is you can bypass the banks because you have more efficient financing out in the capital markets. But the lack of understanding inside of these tech companies about how the capital markets actually work and your ability to access them because you're competing with banks. Banks are going to have a lower cost of capital than a tech company. The way a tech company can have a lower cost of capital than a bank is if they access the capital markets. But you look at the sort of lack of sophistication inside of these tech companies when it comes to understanding uh, financial markets. And I think that they're really missing an opportunity. I think that will be the next space is where you see these tech companies, like you said, pick a specific market area to go after. And then instead of doing it through a bank or partnering with a bank, you actually go around them and you partner with an investment bank and you go out into the capital markets. Yeah. I think, I mean, to your, to your question around, hey, what do you do if you're an executive at a legacy, legacy financial institution? Yeah. How do you react? And um, I mean, I think it's, it's fascinating to me, you know, having sort of been involved in technology and, um, and different markets to have seen how they react. And what always struck me, I mean, whether you look at the retail industry back with, with um, when Amazon entered, whether you look at the uh, news industry, the television industry, the newspaper industry, et cetera, like you just go down and what you see as a pattern in all of those industries that have been disrupted by technology is that the incumbents say our industry is different. We're not going to be affected. Right. Um, we've got our brand. We've got a distribution. We're different. Now, what I notice about the financial institutions is actually um, they're the first major industry that I've seen that actually recognizes the issue. And I think because they've seen right. so many other challenges, so many other industries disrupted. So I think, so you, think you think they're reacting appropriately. Quickly. Well, that's the next question. I think they're recognizing the challenge. Yeah. I think the challenge is for them, though, is how do they react, right? And so I think that most uh, financial institutions are employing a host of strategies, right? They are, they're doing the classic, they're investing in companies, they're buying companies, and they're building within, and they're trying to do all things. Um, but I think that at the end of the day, and some of these executives that I've talked to at financial institutions, you know, they're in a bit of a bind because they are, fin they are public companies, and while they know they need to basically disrupt themselves, at the same time, they got to meet next quarter's financial targets. They got to meet Wall Street's targets sure. in the next quarter. And so I think it's, it's and tough. Most of these startups are presumably unprofitable entities right. that are, you know, not going to improve market. Exactly. You know, improve yeah. I mean, where there's an easy win is for the um, incumbent players to use technology in order to drive greater efficiencies, in order to better meet customer needs. Internally. Yeah. Internally. So sure. in order to adopt these enabling technologies that help them be more efficient. Um, you know, that's a relatively easy step that they're sure. that we see them taking. Well, and, and you can't separate, you know, what's happening in the technology space from what's happening in the financial services industry, right? I mean, it is a race for scale, right? These guys have to get bigger because their margins are getting compressed, whether you're a bank or you're a large asset manager. And so their focus is on scale and growth. Therefore, their ability to invest in technology, I think is limited, which is why I think what you'll see them end up having to do is they'll have to buy technology to bring it onto their platform. Or I think a more likely scenario is what you'll see these large banks and large asset managers become they're just square peg, square hole businesses and everything else will just go to the outside, go to these smaller uh, fintech companies. Because anybody who starts, look, I started an investment firm this past year and I left a large asset manager. Technology is at the core of what we do, not because we're a fintech company. Technology is at the core of what we do because we started our business in 2018. 
anytime you're starting a, a finance business in 2018, you're going to be a fintech business no matter what it is you do. And I think like evidence of that is if in the you know if you live in the U.S. and you want to get a mortgage, you can go online just like you're uh, buying a plane ticket on Expedia. So I think that these companies that are going to be started, whatever financial company gets started today, yeah. is going to be a fintech company, even if you're just a plain vanilla asset manager. From the from the challenger point of view, you know, let's take a company like uh, like Robinhood, right? Which is now a massive, you know, at least valuation success story. Um, when you're starting out and you're looking at like Charles Schwab, right? Yeah. It doesn't look like an easy ride. I think one big challenge for fintech companies, especially, is just regulation. The fact that these are very regulated markets. It's not like you know, tomorrow I can you know set up a lemonade stand and start handing out right. million dollar loans, right? Um, so, uh, if you're a challenger here, I mean, you, you see these incumbents as somewhat stodgy, lumbering institutions, but they're sort of protected, right, by a regulation framework that, you know, these companies have been around for sometimes over 100 years. What are you gonna do about it? Yeah. yeah. So, so if you're a challenger, how do you deal with the regulations? I mean, I think that it's interesting, and we see different dynamics on that in different countries around the world. Right, obviously every Europe's gonna be different than the US, right? Exactly, so it's, so it's very different and even in the US, often state by state it's different. We have an uh, insurance company in the US and they actually need to be licensed in every single state that they want to operate in. So it really varies, um, but I think for these uh, challenge, um, the sort of challenging co challengers, I think the big, the big challenge for them is to get the distribution rapidly, right? And so right. I often think, hey, you, if you're a big incumbent, you have the customer base and the brand name, but you don't have the technology, you don't have the innovation. And if you're a young company, you have the innovation, you have the value proposition, you have the offering, but you don't have the distribution. And so then it becomes very much, hey, how do you scale quickly? How can you get customers at a reasonable cost relative to the value of those customers? And yeah. I mean, one thing about a lot of financial institutions, which is different from a lot of businesses, is there, are, is there tends to be a very high value of each customer, which enables them to um, you know, spend more on customer acquisition. Well, I think, yeah, I, I agree with that. But the, the, the thing that I think is also important is that if you look at the regulatory environment post-financial crisis with Dodd-Frank, I think what you've ended up with is the banks are going to become, you know, I said this earlier, like, you know, square peg, square hole businesses. They're gonna stay within the framework uh, that, that the regulators and also their shareholders want them to. So they're pretty well defined what the banks are gonna be. I think what the result of that is, is that you actually end up with a lot of innovation happening away from that space, right? So the banks are gonna become, you know, the people that work there aren't dumb, but the banks will become dumb pipes. And I think what you'll end up with is that a lot of the innovation, whether it be technological innovation, but also like financing creativity and coming up with new financing structures, those will happen away from the banks and away from the large asset managers. And I think what you'll see if you're the, you know, next generation of financial institutions uh, is that you're gonna go one of two ways. Either one, you'll say, we're gonna stick to our thing, we're gonna be this boutique, and you know, if we invest in this space, we'll have a few billion dollars of AUM, maybe a little bit more, or you'll be bought and put onto a platform like a big institution, like a BlackRock or somebody like that. Right. So if you're starting a business today, I think you go one of two ways, and I think a lot of that is driven by regulation, but also uh, the shareholders of these institutions. There's been a lot of, there was, there have been several iterations of kind of venture capital and private equity's interest in fintech. Kind of started with lending, uh, which seems to basically, you know, if you talk to most VCs, they want pretty little to do with that space these days. Obviously, it's very regulated. Um, it's now moved into, you know, like personal wealth management, companies like Wealthfront, um, real estate, Open Door, which some people would consider a fintech company. What do you guys kind of see as like, in, in the fintech world, you know, we we're talking about how that phrase sort of lost meaning, but like, where do you see like next couple years fintech moving, and especially from the investor's point of view? Like, are there specific sub areas that you think are actually attractive um, from a returns point of view for you guys? I, I mean, I think um, one of the hottest areas right now that we're seeing a lot of growth is reg tech, so regulatory tech. So uh, explain what that is. Or yeah, so regulatory tech. So this is companies that uh, facilitate the uh, facilitate financial institutions or enable financial institutions to comply with the regulations. So, uh, for instance, we have a company that's in a uh, foreign exchange, 
and they are helping mid-tier banks do complex financial or foreign exchange transactions for the first time because these mid-sized banks have never been able to do complex foreign exchange transactions because the regulatory uh, hurdle is so high. And now this company is enabling those players to play to participate in the financial exchange markets because they have this auto, this back end that enables them to comply with regulation. So I mean, that's one example. I know that that's getting a lot of attention and a lot more dollars are going into red tech. You're, you're, you're getting pitches on, pitches on that you were not getting a couple years ago? Yes, absolutely. I mean, ins I know insurance tech is one area. I've seen the data in terms of, you know, insurance tech is getting a lot more funny, more uh, investments than historic than they have historically. How about you, Adam? Uh, well, I mean, like, I think the thing that will be interesting and to me, the question is, and this is not an, an answer or a prognostication, is will you see these fintech companies move into spaces that are capital intensive? And as of now, we haven't seen it, right? Areas they're not in already, basically. Yeah, they're, they're, not, they're not trying to get into these industries where, you know, things that are labeled as fintech tend not to be in spaces that are capital intensive. And I think it'll be interesting to see, you know, in our experience, I've been struck by the lack of sophistication amongst the VCs as to understanding how markets and the financial industry actually works. And they tend to choose to play in spaces like what you just said, going reg tech or having these like, you know, narrow approaches that are more of a services based business instead of a true finance business. And I think that anybody that's starting a business, you know, I said it earlier, anybody that's starting a financial business today, that's an asset manager, that's an investor, they're a tech company, but no one labels them as tech companies. Everyone just treats them as finance businesses. And I'll be curious to see if somebody who comes at it from a tech perspective actually gets into a capital intensive business versus what you see right now, which is people like me starting capital intensive businesses where we put a lot of money to work and we use technology, right? right. So technology is the lag, not, not the lead. That's something that VCs would want to do, right? No, they don't. Be... They clearly, I mean, you talk, I mean, you talk to them and you know, not, not to sound disparaging, but like, it's just not their background. So you talk to them um, and a lot of them, when you're in, in, I think this is particularly true in San Francisco, is in their mind, they're like, how are you the Warby Parker of finance? And I'm like, we're, we're not, right? right? And I think that there's this perspective um, that they bring that actually isn't necessarily a good fit um, for what would traditionally be considered, you know, finance. Right, so presumably they could go out to banks and start getting loans or right bootstrap these businesses. Well, well, think about like, I mean, you could go out and use technology to originate mortgages and securitize them out into the capital markets. If I were to start that business today, people would call us a tech, uh, would call us a finance company. They wouldn't call us a tech company, but you'd be using a ton of technology to allow you to do that, which lowers your cost of customer acquisition, allows you to have a higher margin business. You can use that money to redeploy into technology, but people would perceive you as a finance business. So I think a lot of it's perception of what's a tech company, what's a finance company, and what's fintech. Basically, anything can be fintech if you want to. <laughs> Web yeah. Summit is a fintech yeah. company. We're yeah. all, we all fintech companies. Yeah. Uh, okay, thanks guys, appreciate it. Great, thanks, thanks. very much.